All right. Welcome back to the undergraduate seminar, everyone. Uh, we're very glad to have Kenny Lee here, who's going to give us an introduction to modular forms and elliptic curves. Kenny, take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm Kenny Lee. I'm a first year undergraduate student at University of Toronto. Today, I would like to introduce um, the idea behind the definition of elliptic curve and modular form. Um, I hope that um, students with no background in group theory and complex analysis will still understand part of the theory. Um, and finally, I will talk about some application about much more form elliptic curve. But of course, as an undergraduate student, I may not be able to explain all the proof. I will just kind of mention the facts about them. So the first thing I want to do is to clarify a little bit what a curve is to students who know differential geometry. So intuitively, a curve is something, um, some of the perfection of something you can draw on a paper. But there are several definitions um, in mathematics. For example, in differential geometry, you might define a curve as an image of differential, continuously differentiable function. Um, but today we will use the definition in algebraic geometry which define the curve as um, the solution set of the polynomial in two variables. So for example, a unit circle can be viewed as the polynomial described by x squared plus y squared minus one. And the locus of this equation uh, where the polynomial equals zero is what we call the unit circle, which of course is a curve. And I also want to point out that actually th there is some deep connection between algebraic curve and uh, analytic curve, because in some sense they are both rigid. Um, rigid here means uh, when you try to define a function locally near the points on the curve, then um, the overall property or behavior of the function over the curve is almost determined by the behavior near that point. And you can see this is not the case for topological curve or differentiable curve. For example, take the infinitely many differentiable uh, function, let's say bump function on a real manifold, then it is um, it has a locally valued one, but um, it is equal to zero everywhere else. So in this sense, those manifolds are floppy. Uh, but don't worry too much if you don't understand this remark because it won't affect too much about um, our understanding. Um, I just want to point out that um, from later on, you will see that a little bit curve is more or less like a complex torus which is again, a analytic manifold. So um, I want to start by stating the formal definition for a little bit curve. So a little bit curve is formally defined as a smooth projective algebraic curve of genus one. And we have, we have to specify the field of definition, but in most of the case, the elliptic curve are described by the equation y squared equal to x cubed plus ax plus b. So defining on the field, meaning that um, first A and B are the elements of that field, and we are just looking at the points uh, on that field. For example, if you look at the real um, the curve, it look, looks like the graph like this, these two examples. But this graph is just part of the elliptic curve. The reason why is that we have to understand the projective space. So the idea of projective space is like describe what you can see in the graphical perspective. So imagine you want to draw something you see in 3D space to the 2D plane, which is like a paper. Then the geometry on the paper is um, quite different from what is in the, the 3D you look in space. For example, you can see the um, red line here represents um, the parallel, parallel line in 3D space, but uh, on the 2D plane, they were joined at one point. This point is called vanishing point in visual arts, uh, but in mathematics, we will call it point at infinity. Um, to, define the math, um, to define the projective space in, math, um, in mathematical term, we will say, um, take the equivalent class of two points if there exists a non-zero element in the field, such that P2 equal to lambda P1. And then we will consider P1 and P2 are the same point. Um, here, lambda P1 means you multiply the lambda to both the coordinates. Um, so you can think of this as a vector space. 
Um, so you first consider a 3D vector space, and then you consider the point um, is the line passing through the 3D space. And then now this point will correspond, uh, this line will correspond to just one point on the projective plane. So it is something like this. Um, this red line will intersect this red plane at exactly one point. Um, in order to define a curve on a projective plane, we have to check that um, P1 and lambda P1 now is the same point on projective plane, just lies on the same curve. But you will see it is not the case for our elliptic curve, because for our first equation, where you substitute P1 to the elliptic curve, it does not imply the second one, which in, um, substitutes lambda P1 to the curve. Um, there's no direct connection of this equal to equation. And you see what's the problem here. The problem here is that the lambda has different degree. You can imagine that if the second equation has um, all the term multiplied by lambda cube, then you can divide the whole equation by lambda cube, and it is equivalent to the first equation. And this is the reason why we have to consider homogeneous polynomial. And to do this, uh, we add one more variable, just like um, we are from a 2D space with two variables, and now we move on to a 3D space with three variables. And now look at this um, homogeneous polynomial here. Uh, uh, homogeneous means um, every term has a total degree of three. Um, and if you put uh, the variable C equal to one, then the points um, P equal to um, X, Y, one correspond to our original point on the plane in two variables. And you will see um, um, this X, Y point does not describe all the solution to the polynomial in three variables because we can put C equal to zero. And this will force um, X equal to one and Y is arbitrary number. Um, and this is what we call the point infinity because when we kind of think of the change of variable here, it is kind of like dividing x by the zero. Um, so to be a elliptic curve, it also have to be smooth and has genus one. So the next thing to do is to briefly talk about what this, what does it mean by smooth and genus one? So um, smooth in geometry doesn't mean the same thing as smooth in an analysis. Um, smooth, in, smooth curve in geometry means there's no clubs and self in a section. So um, again, this is a nice curve you can draw um, because um, singular here usually means in mathematics, like something behave bad. So smooth means has no bad points. And to define the bad points, we can consider the um, partial derivative which um, it is not much different from the usual derivative, except we, when we this uh, partial derivative with respect to X is treating Y as a constant. Um, and the curve is this defined as non-singular at that point if both of the derivative, partial derivative are not both zero. Um, and for example, this curve Y squared equal to X cubed has a club as zero because you can see First, it is singular singular points because the partial derivative at approach zero. Um, um, you can see on the um, graph of the plots of this curve, um, then there's a clubs at this origin. And why is it a bad point? Because um, in algebraic geometry, it is almost like a line everywhere, um, except at this point, um, it is bijective to the line, but this it does not have an inverse morism in algebraic geometry. So it has a very weird behavior. Um, and for our case of the little curve, um, um, we only need to check that the discriminant of polynomial in x, which is the part x cubed plus x plus b, um, we have to force this um, discriminant not to go zero, because this means um, the polynomial part has no repeated roots and is related to the fact that the derivative has no zero. Um, uh, the next thing to talk about is genus one. 
Well, it is a very difficult concept in algebraic geometry or topology, um, but intuitively it just means the number of holes. For example, a torus will have hold one and a sphere here has hold zero. Um, and in fact, um, later on we will see uh, elliptic curve over complex numbers really a torus, uh, at least in topologically. Um, but you might ask, um, why elliptic curve are called lift in, in, in if it is a really a torus because the literature have a genus zero. So it should not be something like a torus. Um, well, this is because um, elliptic curve is related to the function called elliptic function. And elliptic function is something that defines, that can be defined on the complex torus. Uh, and the elliptic function is called elliptic because it is related to the special kind of elliptic integral. But uh, after all, it is not, it does not have so much connection with lips. So elliptic curve is actually a not a very good name. So to explain why elliptic curve is a tours, we have to look at the definition of tours. Um, so it is defined as the set of complex number and module out the um, lattice, where you can think of the lattice as something um, generated by two linearly independent real vector. And then you multiply the vector by some integer and then take the linear combination. Um, and the picture of this set is just look like this. You have a many points where each point here is, like this point here is the element of L. And if you multiply out the complex plane uh, by this lattice, we are looking at the parallelogram inside. And why this is um, defines a complex torus is that when we glue the opposite side of the uh, parallelogram, so first of all, um, we consider this pair of opposite side, um, we will have a cylinder and we glue it. And then if we continue to glue the another opposite side, then we will have um, a complex torus. So it's like this. I hope, I hope you can imagine what is happening intuitively here. Um, if you have some difficulty understanding this um, formal definition, you may think of the quotient group or the finite, finite field with um, P elements. The similarity here is that um, in the finite field, the number one is not just meaning one, it also means um, the number one one plus p and one plus two p and so on. So similarly for a complex torus, a complex number inside this parallelogram actually also means um, the same same position in the parallelogram in some other other um, spaces in the complex plane. So you have to consider all of um, all of the complex points. Um, which is different by the addition of the lattice points. Um, and a remark here is um, a, actually a better, better understanding of the um, complex torus is interpreted as the quotient of group action. And in geometry, it forms a complex remus surface, which is a complex analytic manifold. Um, and now we can discuss the elliptic function. So, uh, originally, if the elliptic function is defined as the complex differentiable except some points, um, so that it is called doubly periodic, so that when we kind of add the lattice points to the input, it does not affect the value of the function. So for a period, you can think of something like the sine function and cosine function having period 2 pi, meaning that when you add 2 pi to the inputs, it does not affect the function value of sine and cosine. Um, and similarly, um, elliptic function will repeat its value in every parallelogram. So it is a well-defined function on complex tours because, well, um, different points on different, inside different um, parallelogram in different position will really map to single one complex number by uh, this kind of elliptic function. And the reason why it is called elliptic function is it is the inverse of the elliptic integral. 
Well, but the elliptic integral is the generalization of the lip um, integral that calculate the arc length of the lips look like this. So um, in general, elliptic integral are something like the integral containing, um, integrating the rational function of some square roots of some polynomial. So you can see it really does not have so much a connection with ellipse because um, the most important example of um, today context is the Weisbrot's elliptic function defined in a complicated series like this. And it is a inverse of the elliptic integral in this form. And well, this integral is not really related to ellipse directly. Um, yeah, and but this already gives the name to elliptic curve. So it, it, it is too late to change the name now. Um, so in complex analysis, we can show that the Weisbrot's elliptic function will satisfy the differential like this. So that it is the inverse of the previous integral. And um, the reason why it's related to elliptic curve is that when we change the variable uh, for to, from x to rationalized function and y to its derivative, it would define an elliptic curve. Um, and more importantly, this map is isomorphic. If you know group theory, um, it is a group isomorphic sum so that it preserves the group, um, group operation. But you might ask what is the group operation on the elliptic curve? Because, well, we know how to add the two complex number, but we don't know how to add two points on the curve. Um, well, um, to do this, we can look at kind of the pullback. We can um, look at the inverse of the rationalized elliptic function. So we are mapping the points on the elliptic curve, go back to the complex plane and do the addition on the complex plane first, and then map it back by the elliptic function. Then you will see that the um, geometric um, interpretation of the group law of the elliptic curve is defined in this four um, picture. So I will explain the first one. The first one is saying that um, when you try to add up the points P and Q on the elliptic curve, um, what, you, what you need to do is to first take a line passing through P and Q, and then this line in the first case, we cut at exactly one point, which is R on the elliptic curve. And then R is defined as the negative P plus Q. And here, um, the point infinity O is the group identity. Um, moreover, it is a isomorphic sum in terms of frame surface. And it does have some importance in the study of the curve because it's kind of explained what's happening in our algebraic geometry that um, um, you cannot um, um, map you cannot parameterize the elliptic curve by the rational map or the mesh, map rational function. So to explain this, we can look at the, um, um, the complex projective line, which, um, which is like this. Um, so it is a set of complex number. And then we adjoin the point and infinity here. And if you know complex analysis, you will know that um, it is in fact um, isomorphic to the Riemann sphere. Um, so a projective line is, is just a Riemann sphere and it has a genus zero. And as we saw here, uh, elliptic curve is a torus with, with genus one. So you cannot have a map from a genus zero surface to a genus one surface. So it's kind of explained in an analytic way why you cannot um, parameterize the elliptic function with rational function. Okay, but if you look at the elliptic curve we defined in the previous slide, you might ask what is G2 and G3? So in the previous context, it is like the constant. So it should not depend on the variable C but it should depend on the lattice. Well, um, when we prove the um, differential equation, it suggests that G2 should be something satisfied homogeneous condition. That means if you multiply a, con a constant to the input, you can kind of put it, put, put it out by a lambda, a lambda to the power negative four and negative six respectively. And 
after some modification of the um, variable, um, it is the, the modular form. Um, so here we have to change this kind of depends on two variables into depending on dependence on just one variable. And we require it to be defined on the upper half plane so that this ratio has the imaginary parts um, greater than zero. And well, the reason why we define this is for some technical reason about group theory. Um, and if you want an example, an example is the Einstein series defined again in a complicated series like this. And it defined a module form and G2 and G3 is just um, some scalar multiple of the Einstein series. And the theory um, of the module forms was also used to prove that the discriminant, um, previously it is discriminant of polynomial, but now this discriminant is a module form. Um, and it is used to show that this discriminant is not equal to zero for uh, order C on the upper half plane. So that um, it proves that the previous algebraic curve is really smooth curve. So it is an elliptic curve. Um, and another natural question to ask about elliptic curve in geometry is how can we consider two elliptic curves are the same? So um, you might have seen a lot of this kind of question before in geometry. For example, uh, we consider two triangles are the same uh, when the, the three sides of the triangle are this, have the same length. Um, this means we, we don't care about the, um, the orientation of the triangle. You can kind of um, rotate it or translate it. It does not affect how we interpret the two triangles are the same. We only care about the length. Um, so similar, similar things happen to the elliptic curve. Um, and because it is related to the complex tours, and the complex tours is um, determined by the lattice. So we can work on the lattice. So two lattice remain the same when you rotate or translate it and um, sketch both sides of the parallelogram at the same amount. Um, and mathematically, this is done by considering the two by two matrix with integers entries and determinant one. Um, and here we take the lattice generated by tau and one. And the point I want to make here is when we apply the matrix to the vector of um, tau and one, it should give another vector, which um, this vector is also generates um, the lattice where a tau plus b and c tau plus d are two generators of the new um, kind of new lattice. But um, if the matrix A, B, C, D are have integer entries and determinant one by the previous argument, it should define the very same lattice. Um, so it helps how to how can we identify to um, identical elliptic curve in geometry. Um, and here it comes to another concept in geometry is the modulus moduli space. And this gives the name of modular form in some sense. Um, so in geometry, the moduli space is the space so that the points on that space will classify certain geometric objects. Um, for example, circles can be classified by its radius. So here it means uh, we don't care about where the circles is located. Uh, we say both circles are, are identical if they have the same radius. So the moduli space of a circle is positive real line, where one point on the positive real line will correspond to the radius, and the radius will identify the circle. So we want to know what is the moduli space for the curve. So by the previous argument, it is related to saying the complex number tau and whether we can find the matrix, two by two matrix with integer entries and determine one so that it defines the same lattice. And um, after some calculation, the moduli space of, modul modul uh, of the elliptic curve look like the gray region here. And another understanding of this gray region is that um, from outside the gray region, any point, any complex number um, outside the gray region, uh, we can find a matrix that 
after some um, operation uh, defined in the previous way, then it will make it back to the gray region. So a technical term is for this is um, the gray region here is actually the fundamental domain of the group action by the, um, if, if you know group theory, it is called the special linear group. And then um, after this action acting on um, the complex plane by the definition here, so you, you can see um, this actually comes from the previous argument that uh, numbers C and AC plus B and over CC plus D should be kind of related in the same lattice. Um, and if you do a complex analysis, this is called the Mobius transform. Um, and the fundamental domain is just a gray region here. Um, so what a modular form is, uh, we can build modular form as a differential form on the moduli space. Um, so it means it satisfies the equation like this. So it is unchanged when, when you apply the matrix to the, um, to, to the complex number C. And if you don't know differential form, you can think of this expression as something you will um, write down when you do the change of variable in integration. Um, and we have seen another interpretation for modular form. That is, um, it is the differentiable function that only depends on the lattice, so that um, it is kind of related to the two generator of the lattice, and um, it is satisfies some homogeneous condition, so that um, when you divide the inputs by omega one, um, it will have to put out the omega one two k, where two k here is the weight of the modular form in the definition. Um, and some example is um, like the J invariant function. Again, again, modular forms always defined in a very complicated way uh, because it has a very highly symmetric and kind of very strong condition for being a modular form. So um, there are not so much function that um, that is that's really a modular form. So the, Definition usually very complicated, um, and but the interesting part of J invariant function is that when you try to apply the matrix to the complex number in the previous way, then the value of the function is unchanged. So you can think of this as a function defined on the gray region. So it's map the complex number inside the gray region to the whole complex plane, and um, moreover, this map is bijective. And one important feature for J invariant function is that actually all the modular forms that is invariant, um, that's unchanged under the um, action of all the operation of the matrix on complex number, those um, modular forms is in fact the rational function of J invariant function. And similar things happen for Eisenstein series, which has the waste 2K. We can see um, waste two k means you can pull out this um, factor here if you try to apply the matrix to a complex number. Um, and in fact, the modular forms of waste certain weight um, is the product, or yeah, it's the product of the Eisenstein series. So it suggests that J invariant function and Eisenstein series are kind of the most fundamental function for um, um, uh, modular forms. Um, and in fact, similar things happen for the theory of elliptic function. Um, so in the previous elliptic function, the fundamental domain is the parallelogram we discussed. And um, in fact, all the elliptic functions are the rational function of the Weierstrass elliptic function and it's uh, derivative. So um, two theory actually has a lot of similar property. Well, and now we have two interpretation for modular form. So math mathematician will try to um, use some condition to cover all the properties of this. And it comes up with a axiomatic definition of like this. 
we're saying modular form is a complex differentiable function so that it satisfies the equation here. So this equation is called the modularity condition, which is, you can think of this as the most important feature of the modular form. Um, however, mathematicians also require modular form to be bounded when the imaginary parts tends to infinity. Um, this condition um, is to ensure modular form can be expressed in terms of the series expansion, where Q is equal to two by IC. Um, the reason for doing this is that um, modular forms has, when we when they expand in a series like this, their coefficients have, are surprisingly informative. It has a very amazing or very unexpected predicting power. So um, actually the development of the modular forms um, has a lot of coincidence in the mathematical history. So the examples are, First, the J invariant function is related to finite group, um, where the monster group here is kind of the, uh, the largest finite group, which has about eight to eight times five, 10 to the 53 elements, um, which is really a huge but finite group. Um, and the connection from the J invariant function of the most of the group goes very deep and it is related to the coefficient. For example, the coefficient 196884 appears in the J invariant function. Actually, it corresponds to the fact that there exists a um, complex vector space with dimension 196883, so that the elements of the monster groups are some kind of matrix X on the vector space with the huge dimension. Uh, and then the second example is that uh, when we have, when we take the Eisenstein series four and divide it by some constant, um, so it should be a theta four because we are already take k equal to two. And when we expand this series, um, the coefficient of this expansion corresponds to um, some special lattice and um, the number is the number of vectors on the lattice so that it has certain norm. For example, 240 here means um, there is 240, 240 vectors in the lattice so that the norm of the lattice, uh, the norm of the vector is two. And similar things for um, 2160. So it is the number of vectors having a norm four. And it is related to the problem of sphere packing, which asks about um, how can we pack the sphere in the um, dimension, n dimension space in the most efficient way. And um, the Eisenstein series G4 is related to eight dimensional space. Um, and a fun fact about sphere packing is that uh, up to now, mathematicians only know the optimal sphere packing density in the space of dimension one, two, three, and then eight, and then 24. The reason why we can do the dimension eight and 24 is because of the theory of modular form. Um, but in general, um, it is difficult to do even in the space of dimension three. So we cannot, so far we cannot do uh, for the dimensional four cases. Um, so up to now, we have seen a lot of theory from geometry, algebra, um, complex analysis, or even topology. But after all, the importance of the um, theory of modular forms and elliptic curves has been traditionally in the number theory. So um, I also want to mention some application in the number theory. Um, the first example is considered the congruent number. So the congruent number is defined as the positive integer so that this number is also the area of some triangle with rational number sides. For example, um, six is a congruent number because it is the area of the triangle with side three, four, and five, which has an area of three times four over two is six. 
Um, a natural question to ask is, if I give you a positive number, can you determine whether it is a congruent number or not? Um, at first sight, it is a very easy question, and it was considered by the ancient Greeks and Arabs. So it is the, it was a, it is a question for us um, two thousand years before, but it is still unsolved today. Um, what we know about the criteria for congruent number is that um, we know n is congruent number if n negative elliptic curve of y square equal to x cubed minus n square x has infinitely many rational numbers points. Um, this is related to the $1 million problem, which is the famous Bridge and Schroeder Dyer conjecture, which, uh, which is relates the um, number r, which appears in the group of the elliptic, function, elliptic curve over rational number. And the conjecture asks about whether the L function of this um, elliptic curve will have a order of zero at s equal to one, same as the number r. So it is related to kind of the algebraic um, information about the curve to in a kind of analytic way. Um, so if this BSD conjecture is tr true for the elliptic curve, um, then there exists an algorithm that can check whether n is congruent or not. Um, but you may ask, what is the L function here? In fact, there are lots of L function in number theory, and there is no um, unified definition for L function. So uh, L function only usually refer to the functions with similar property. So for example, the prototype is the Raymond Seda function. Um, it is defined in this series like this, um, one over n to the s, where s is a complex number. And the definition only works for real parts of s greater than one. Um, but it can be extended by the complex analysis. Um, um, and the fact that the Raymond Seda function um, is not equal to zero at the real, real part of s equal to one was used to prove that the prime number theorem proved that the, which states that the prime number great, uh, smaller than x is a function approximate by the function natural log x over x. And another famous um, $1 million problem is the Raymond hypothesis, which asks about whether or not the or the non-trivial zero of this function is lies on the real line, where s, no, um, where the real parts of s is equal to a half. And if that conjecture is true, then mathematicians can improve this approximation here quite a lot. Um, and the next thing to talk about is the first L function in history. So it is the direct L function defined in a similar way to the Raymond Seda function, but with an extra term. Well, it is in fact a function which is um, Dirich character. Well, a character is again the technical term in real theory. Um, um, and the fact that the L function is not equal to zero at s equal to one was used to prove that there are infinitely many prime of the form a plus n d for the greatest common divisor of a d is equal to one. So you can see it is like the paradigm in number theory that it constructs a L function and ask for the zero, some behavior of the zero of the L function at s equal to one. And the idea of L function can be generalized a little bit. You can think of it as taking the number or the function a n to a series look like this. So this is what we call a Dirich series. Um, in fact, the coefficient of some special kind of the module form can be used to make a new L function. For example, the modular discriminant is when we expand it in a series in terms of Q and we call the coefficients as a function um, tau of n, then when, when we make this into the Dirich series, which is um, the series of tau n over n to the s, it will define the L function. 
And another example is the Eisenstein series. Um, when we take the coefficient of the Eisenstein normalized Eisenstein series, it is like the divisor function. And if we put the divisor function in the Dirac series, so we consider the sum where the um, divisor function over n to the s and sum over from n to infinity, then this function will correspond to uh, more or less like the zeta function, the Riemann zeta function, except there is um, kind of the product of them. Um, well, but you might ask, what is the definition of L function for the curve? Um, it is in, in fact very com complicated in general. For our case um, of the, the um, elliptic curve of interest, the L function looks like this. Um, where the only thing that depends on the elliptic curve is the number r subgroup of n subgroup of r, which denotes the number of points on the elliptic curve, which is over the finite field with p to the r element. So originally, it is a elliptic curve um, over a rational number. And the number of um, points over the finite field is kind of um, part of the some of the points on the curve, this curve. And the idea of this L function is kind of collects all the information varying from all the R and all the P and collects all together by a sum and some products. Um, so it is the kind of definition for L function in general. Um, and you may ask, um, what we, what's if we write this L function in the Darish series form? And it is amazing and unexpected that turns out it is related to a modular form, meaning that when we express the L function in the series um, like a n over n to the s, um, and we collect all the term a n here and put it back in the expansion in Q, where Q is the two pi e to the two pi i c or two pi i s then this already, this will give another special kind of modular form. So you can see here, it has a very um, weird connection between the curve and modular form. You may interpret this as a um, prediction of the modular form that um, the coefficients of modular form um, kind of correspond to the number of solution over the finite view um, on, the, uh, on the L function on the elliptic curve, sorry. Um, so this is the implication of the modularity theorem, which connects the elliptic curve and a new object called modular curve. And well, um, as mentioned before, elliptic curve cannot be parametrized by a projective line because they're different genus. Um, but this theorem say that um, it can be parametrized by the modular curve some sense. Um, but what a modular curve is, it is um, something related, or you can say it is the generalization of what we consider in the modularized space, because it is defined by classifying the curves with extra condition. Um, for example, the modular curve here, which is x naught, um, is saying that instead of considering all the matrix with determinant one and um, integer entry, we impose one extra condition saying that C should be congruent to zero mod N. And this associates to the information about a little curve that it's um, kind of considered the select subgroup of order N of the group of the elliptic curve over rational number. And the significance of this is it was used to prove the Fermat's last theorem. Um, so Fermat's last theorem is, um, Actually, the statement is also simple. Uh, so similar for the similar similar to the case of congruent number. In fact, um, many theorem or conjecture in number theory, the um, the statement is pretty simple, but um, no one knew how to prove them um, in some of the cases. So this is the famous open question for three hundred years. Um, so it asks about the Fermat equation like um, x to the n plus y to the n equal to c to the n. 
whether or not it has positive integer for n, equal to, uh, n greater than three, and it was conjectured by Fermat says it has no positive integer solution. Um, there are some special cases proved in the later 300 years after Fermat's conjecture it. Um, and the breakthrough comes in 1986. Uh, so the ideas look like this. First, we suppose Fermat's last theorem is false, so that there exists positive integer a, b, and c, and prime greater than three, so that a to the p plus b to the p equal to c to, to p. And very related to the elliptic curve, look like this. Um, and then ribbits show that this elliptic curve created by the counterexample of Fermat's last theorem is a semi-stable and not modular curve. And Wiles finally proved the modularity theorem of semi-stable semi elliptic curve, which says that every semi-stable elliptic curve is um, modular. Because um, um, in fact, um, the elliptic curve that can be parameterized by the modular curve is called a modular elliptic curve. So it shows that, in fact, all the, modular, all the elliptic curves is modular. So by contradiction, it is impossible to have a counterexample for Fermat's last theorem. So the Fermat's last theorem is true by contradiction. Um, so this is the end of um, a talk, my talk today. So here's a quick summary. So today we talk about complex numbers, complex elliptic curve is like a tourist. Um, its name comes from its relationship with the elliptic function. And a modular form is something like the function on lattice. And it is a differential form on the space classifying of the curve. Well, and we also see some application of it. That is the coefficient of modular forms are informative. It's related to some um, unrelated topic to complex analysis or the modular form itself, which is about um, um, the sphere packing or the finite group. Um, and finally, the elliptic curve itself is related to congruent number. And the co connection of elliptic curve and modular forms will lead to the proof of the mass loss theorem. So um, I think now we can take some question. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat for people who are attending online. Uh, so if you're attending online, please fill out this seminar feedback form. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, our speaker is an undergrad and would really appreciate feedback on the first talk. Um, so yes, let's take two minutes to fill that out, and then we can get into questions and, and that kind of thing. Cool. Online people, have you filled out the feedback form? Um. Okay, uh, questions for our speaker, things people want to ask. I guess I'm, I'm curious, Kenny, how you got interested in this and how you, how you started learning about elliptic curves. 
Uh, actually, I start this theory by looking at modular form because I've heard that. Um, uh, actually, I've um, I've studied something about Riemann Seidel function before, and um, sometimes I see there is some connection between modular form and Seidel function, and then I'm curious about modular form. And then when I look at modular form, and I, I discover that actually is um, all the definition or the motivation actually comes from the idea of the elliptic curve. Cool. So for you, the story is zeta function is the module. Uh, yes. Cool. Yeah, because this zeta function is very famous. I guess many uh, many undergraduate students have heard of the Riemann hypothesis. Um, other things people want to ask about? Slides are not here. Oh, they're not yet? Okay. Uh, I, I have them. I guess I haven't posted them. So can you send me his slides? I'll post them after seminar today. Um, okay. So the video recording will be made available online. Yeah. Any other things people want to ask about? Thames? Just it's like a personal question. If you want to do some more self study and into the, uh, this topic, where would you, what textbook would you use? Uh, sorry, I cannot hear the question. Here, I'll, I'll repeat Thomas's question. Uh, if you want to do more self study into this topic, where would what book or what articles would you look at? Um, I think the the best book is the uh, first course on modular form uh, written by a diamond and Shimula. And well, but I start this uh, topic by looking at the classical book written by uh, Sarir, uh, which is, I, I'm not really sure about the name. Maybe it's called um, a course on um, aphrobatic and it is a classical one. But um, um, the problem is that maybe um, it's very, um, yeah, it's a very neat and beautiful introduction, but maybe it has, um, sometimes it does not explain too much on the context. So it, it requires a very strong background and some notation are kind of outdated. So um, I will recommend the book by, written by Diamond and Shamula. And for a little bit curve, I also uh, recommend the book by Neil Coplet like this. So it is introduction to elliptic curve and modular form. Um, and new couplets is um, the guy study elliptic curve. So it is good to look at the parts about elliptic curve and the congruent number problem. Thank you. Um, we've got another seminar next week. Uh, Sarah Walker is going to tell us about applications of mathematics to life science. I think it's going to be effect of sed sedatives on people or something. So it'll be a sort of a stats by math kind of talk. Um, thank you for this awesome talk, Kenny. I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you for coming out everyone to summer. We'll see you one next question. Oh, one question. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the slide where we started the definition for modularity? Can you go back to the definition of modularity slide? Uh, okay. Uh, so in here. Uh, so uh, gray, gray, we had the thing. The gray region. Yeah. So oh. go back to slide oh. seven. Okay, here. What this? Uh, I'm not really like good at like all of this when I'm making assumptions right now. Uh, as you hear, what we are thinking is how two uh, curves are same, right? Is that the main gist of the play? And we're taking a point there and then taking the point it lies inside the curve, something like that. You probably want to talk to this. Oh, okay. Sorry, Pete. Uh, sure, yeah, maybe you can repeat your question talking to the speaker. Uh, so what I was like, I'm not really sure, so I might be completely wrong with the understanding of the slide, but what I'm thinking right now is 
Uh, with this slide, we have two different graphs, and we're taking if the graphs can be considered or the, the curves can be considered as same. Is is that the thing? That's the first thing. And then we consider two points or like a point, and then check if that point is on the graph on the curve. Uh, um, I can't really hear the question, but um, I think I can clarify a little bit here. Um, so the gray region here is um all the complex point, so that it is um a kind of not related to each other by the um special matrix. So you can think of this as a set of equivalent class of all the complex number that's related by the matrix. Uh, yeah, you can think um, we define the equivalent relations as um, two complex points are equivalent if there exists a matrix uh, relating them. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions from the room or questions online? Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you at seminar next week.